today we are here at Sterling Sound, where we've been for about 12 years in the Chelsea market. Beautifully designed and really happy here. Gone through the storms and the vicissitudes of the music business over the last 12 years. The amount of time that's needed to master a record really has diminished a lot because uh, having basically having digital files. I mean, it may sound strange, but when you have mixes on analog tape, of an eight-hour session, at least an hour and a half is spent rewinding tape. I mean, it's, it's, it just sounds, sounds incredible, but this, this is a tremendous saving for a client not to have to spend an extra $500 to rewind tape. When given more time to experiment, you could probably come out with something a little bit better. So you're kind of working with budgets in, in a time constraint. And by doing that, you have to learn to work more efficiently. The main element with mastering, I think, is never really be satisfied. There's always something better that you could have done or that you can do. And I think that drives you forward. And um, it's, 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 really, it's really very necessary, I think, to, to really do your best work. Number one, accurate listening environment. You know, over the last five years particularly, there's just an endless amount of problems in the low end. And the reason for that is that rooms are, where people are working are not tuned properly, so they really don't know what they have in the low end. And they'll admit that they don't know exactly what they have in the low end. But to achieve a balanced room in a, in a home environment or in a low-budget studio environment takes a tremendous amount of financial resources and, and uh, you know, constant tweaking and attention. Number two, particularly at Sterling Sound and particularly in my room, the access to analog tools along with plugins. Okay, so uh, you know we have the space, we have the, the ergonomics to be able to accommodate, you know, what I have maybe uh, eight or ten uh, compressors, limiters, uh, different tools that are that are accessible and ergonomically set up so I can actually hear them. Whereas in a home studio, all kinds of impediments to that would occur. So there's another set. There's an ergonomic sense that has to be taken into account. And the third thing would be a professional who has the experience to, you know, not to master one record that sounds good, but to, to, to constantly turn out product from completely different sources. You know, I do a, probably in here about 150 records a year. You know, you want to you be able to, to work with somebody who's a professional who can, who can take what you give him to the next level. And it takes an understanding of your genre and of, uh, you know, of what, what things are supposed to sound like in, his, in, in, in that professional's imagination, in his ear. You know, when I hear a vocal in here, I know that that vocal sounds a certain way. I'm in the same exact in environment. I've been in this room for 12 years. I know what things are supposed to sound like. And when something's even a little bit gr off a little bit, it, I, it, it occurs to me immediately. The stem mastering is something which is very, very connected to the politics of the project before it gets to you. It's a combination of the relationship with the mixer to the mastering guy, but then of the mixer also to whoever his client was, be it the band or the producer, or if he is the producer, then the band or whatever. It, to, to come into a mastering session with stems introduces a, a certain uh, vulnerability uh, by the creative person. Just break down your mix into categories. Say, so you got your drums on one stem, you got your bass on another stem, you got your background vocals on another stem, you got vocals on another stem. Uh, let's go keyboards, you know, uh, horns, whatever, uh, synths. Okay. Now, each one of those stems, everything can be broken out with a D to A converter into the dangerous box, right? And then that box outputs to stereo. So immediately, there's an enhancement that comes from having less information kind of jumbled, jumbled together inside the desk of, the, of Pro Tools. At that point, now I have the mix, and I have the elements, and I also have an analog output of each of the elements. So, for example, a singer who has a very, very kind of high, scratchy voice who used a very bright microphone, now I want to I want to enhance that vocal, and I'm I'm able to use an analog equalizer and add some some richness or an analog compressor to to handle the peaks. You know, particularly with vocals, but also tremendous help with bass because you can handle bass and bass drum separately. Okay, the usual mastering dynamic. I've done my work, and you sonically enhance it to make it better. That, that's one that's one level. Now the next level of stems is I've done my work, but I don't really know what the relationship should be between the elements in the on these stems, which could be you know, guitars, drums, bass, vocals, and whatever keyboards, uh, synth, uh, reverbs, or whatever. Okay, now somebody that comes in with that feeling in their production is coming in really kind of naked in terms of like, well, have I done a good job or not? So that's why I think that 90% of the time, that 95% of the time, it's not a good thing for a producer and engineer to project that, that vulnerability. However, if 
the situation in the record has been such that there's been so many elements in the mix because of the budget, because of the geographical location of the of the uh, of the musicians. Okay, we had to do the guitars in in Wyoming, and then we went to a studio in Miami to do the drums and blah blah blah. And there's been this whole hodgepodge of things, so that everybody in that project is off balance to begin with. Perfect opportunity to come in with stems and let somebody outside the project evaluate it and have the ability to balance it a little bit. Anything that gets to, to the goal line, to me, is always, I'm, I'm happy to help. And that was one thing with the Dangerous Box, that we're able to really get a good result from the stems. Now, that being said, once we started talking about this idea three or four years ago, a lot of people started to set up their, their home studios so that they were actually doing the same thing before it got here. So, you know, it's kind of a, like a hybrid, like the, the mastering kind of spill over into the mix or the mix spilling over to the mastering. You know, we all really do the same thing. I really do like to add a, at least one piece of analog gear every year. Kind of lets you reevaluate the rest of the stuff in your rack. So I have a Focusrite, I have an API, this Prism, Mazlac, and I have a Manly. Each one of them has a high pass filter. Each one of them sounds completely different, but they sound much closer to each other than to the backs. It's been a great addition to the room. I mean, it's something which uh, there's, there's not a single uh, project that goes by without me checking out to see what it does in the low end because it has a very distinct quality in the low end of being able to harness the, the, the low end without alternate dynamics. Now, if the mix doesn't need those dynamics, it, it, the Bax doesn't do enough to help you rein it in. But if the, uh, if the bass drum and the bass are recorded in such a way where those dynamics are really necessary to make the mix work, there's nothing that works like the backs. It has a three-dimensional quality in the bottom that I don't have with any of my other pieces. It actually is a pretty good go-to for, uh, for the, uh, the low shelf yes. in terms of adding a little bit of uh, clarity to the, uh, to, the, to the bass. 74, right? Uh, sure, 74, more than, more than any of the other frequencies. Occasionally up here, not too much up at 230, but that's a frequency which generally is a rollout frequency rather than an add frequency. Every single thing I do in the low end is always the go-to, and it's the first go-to when I hear harshness. The way it has of rolling out some harsh frequencies between like, like what was that, 3.7, 3.4, 4.8. I mean, I, I, again, it's, it's, it's a constant go-to when something, uh, use the word irritating, when there's an irritating element to guitars or to vocals or to the mix in general. Uh, it has a way of, of, of smoothing without taking away like the kind of the, the sound of the reverb and kind of smearing everything up. The hardest thing to do is, is to equalize something which is both bright and dull at the same time, which is frequent, well, not frequent, but it happens. <laughs> so, you know, it's nice to have the backs for that. What I do uh, now is I do captures, I'll listen to a mix, get an idea of what I want to do, get something close, on, on, usually on the focus right first, and then capture like 20 minutes of that then immediately tried the same frequency, pretty much the same frequency on the backs. If I'm on the backs, fine, then I'll shoot the backs out with the prism uh, it, when it comes to low end. So uh, all this is like 30 seconds of one song, then boom, 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 back and forth, and then get an idea. Everything starts to take shape at that point. Mix starts to open up, have some dimension, and then once I settle on that, I'll do another song or two. And if it seems like there's a, you know, particularly with international projects, it seems to be much more um, uh, all done in the same room. There's, there's, a, there's a consistency in terms of production, uh, and, you know, anything from Spain, from Italy, from France. Uh, usually it's, it's not like in the U.S. where you can have 12 songs and like there's two, you know, six different, completely different studios, producers or whatever. So I, you know, if, if I'm settling on the backs for doing something, I usually stick with that for the whole album. And if I get to a, a song where it's no longer working or I don't feel so good, then I kind of go back. So it's all these quick captures. All I can say is the backs is a very big player in you know, I'd say 80% of what I do, either in terms of participating in the shootout or actually being used. And that, there's a perfect example where stems be invaluable because, you know, once you start taking out the super highs from a stereo mix, you just can take the life out of it. There's no way. What's going on musically in the low end? What, you know, what's the bass player doing? How can I make this record as warm as possible without making it muddy so that, so that you shift, you're shifting the focus away from the, the high end? Very, very dangerous territory. This is like instantly alert, like this is going to be a tough day. But that, that, that would be my, my first impulse is to, is to just see, okay, now how does the vocal sound? Can the vocal be richer? Can the guitars have a little deeper sound? Once I get something, I go back to the mix and I set the mix up so that the peak level of the mix flat is exactly the same peak level to my ear and to my eye on the meters. And then when I go back and forth, just be completely brutally honest, even if I spend a half hour on a song, 
What, what, what am I losing? Because that's what, that's what the person is going to be listening to before it gets here. He's listening to his mix. And a lot of times he's listening to his mix 8 dB lower. So I got to listen to that and I got to say, okay, even though the other one like hurt my ears, it just sounded more exciting. Okay, now I have to retrench, go back, split the difference, take a little bit out, go, you know, find it as a spot. And then also at one point you got to say to yourself, okay, there's a limitation to how good this is going to sound. And let's anticipate what the client is trying to do with the mix. And if people like high end and they like their ears to be singed and they like the excitement and the, frene the frenetic nature of the top, give the people what they want and make them happy. I mean, I recently had a run of two or three albums where the cymbals were way too loud on the drum recording. And if musicians are involved in the production part, you know, they really, they really lose high end, those guys. The guys that play drummers, you know, if, they, if they're involved, they don't, they, the, 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 those sounds just don't bother them. And they really impede listening to a record loud. And we all, you know, we all like to crank up and listen loud, but nobody wants to get hurt listening loud, you know. And oh, I, 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 anytime there's an album, there's no, you know, there was an album one time I, I forgot the name of it, but I remember the, the, there was no cymbals on the drums. I was, this is my, my dream come true. It sounds so good, it's so listenable, you know. But.